Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast, brought to you by Vertical Street Ventures, where we talk to top experts and seasoned investors to help provide clarity and key insights to keep you safe on your journey to financial freedom. Our goal is to help you get educated on how to create passive income for you and your family using real estate as your vehicle. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and a written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Hey everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to our newest host that we're bringing on to the podcast team. His name is Peter Pomeroy. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Peter over the last year and his growth in this space has been tremendous. He comes from a background in commercial real estate and I know you're going to enjoy all the value he's going to bring to the show. He is now an owner operator himself in the multifamily space. So welcome Peter Pomeroy. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate Podcast. My name is Peter Pomeroy and I'm your host. Today we have Dan Kreisenowski with us. Dan is an active capital raiser, equity owner, passive investor, generating double digit yields uh, and lower taxes via commercial real estate. Dan's investment portfolio includes 2,600 plus storage units, over 1,500 apartment units and dozens of industrial infrastructure and other properties. Dan has personally raised millions of dollars from accredited investors and family offices. Uh, Dan is the founding vice president of Rocket Dollar, unlocking the 10 trillion pool of untapped retirement assets for the alternative investment community. He previously led commercial real estate initiatives for GE Capital in Mexico and South America. And Dan's superpowers include self-storage, self-directed accounts, and Scranton, Pennsylvania. Dan, welcome to the show. Awesome, Peter. Great to be with you all today. Yeah, great, great bio. It's uh, I, I get such uh, enjoyment reading um, everyone's bios that come on the show uh, because they're so uh, kind of unique and interesting. So let's get into it. Um, first question. In your bio, you mentioned Scranton, Pennsylvania. What's what's the story there? Yeah, well, first of all, it's never as warm in Scranton as it's here in Austin, Texas, <laughs> or, uh, as I hear for you guys out west in San Fran today. So uh, tis the, the ice room, as I like to call it. No frills, but got AC here. Um, yeah, you know, Scranton, I, uh, I think I grew up at the right place at the right time. I... Uh, you know, I joke that I played Little League on uh, Biden, same field as President Biden, and then nice. I rode with Trump Jr. Uh, shortly after my tenure in Scranton. But uh, yeah, I mean, probably a lot of the 20th century success stories a lot of folks had. You had the World War II generation, uh, a bit more entrepreneurial, and then my parents' generation, a bit more, say, union side. My dad was a teacher principal, my mom was a social worker, and, uh, you know, kind of lived a great life, small town America, as they talk about. And uh, so I, you know, humbled and blessed and it was a good kickstart. And I think the kind of the grit and the cultural DNA is a, uh, is great to be inside of me. Uh, you know, flip side, as I said, not as much of a deeply entrepreneurial community. So regardless of what schools and such I went to, it takes a little while as like, you know, Kiyosaki says to kind of share, uh, shake the rich dad, poor dad sort of mentality. Right, right. Well, I went to college in Ohio. And uh, my wife's family, they're from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Cincinnati, Ohio. So I have a d deep respect and uh, appreciation and, and just kind of love the people out there. Yeah. All right. So um, GE Capital, just quickly tell us what you were like, because like, I think it may frame um, some things up perhaps, but um, what were you up to with GE Capital um, in Mexico, South America, New York? Yeah, so I came to GE when, uh, you know, although Jack Welsh was no longer there, he was there in spirit, I'll put it that way. So, uh, and, you know, at that time, some folks already had the crystal ball to 2008, which made, uh, you know, politicking as I was, uh, you know, half the time with HQ in Connecticut, and then the other half time with new acquisitions. So we had the benefit, we had a large office uh, portfolio out in uh, Southern California that I came to kind of integrate into GE. And then I feel one of my claims to fame in Mexico City was, you know, the spirit of soccer or football, as we call it, uh, you know, doing extensions of go to market that were on the both offensive defensive side. And the net result was the portfolio that we had. And it was a mix of OIR uh, was one of the few in the world that did not lose money kind of in 08, 09. So I was a tiny piece of it as, as anybody is a GE, but wow, what a dynamite experience that people, uh, you know, I'd say really leverage data for what it was at that time. It's nothing like AI and such today, but especially processes, which 
I still feel kind of what I learned and exhibited at GE is still best to breed out there, uh, even to this day. Excellent. I, well, I have a, a share. I, I mean, it's different but similar experience. I was a management consultant at Deloitte, and um, uh, which was after business school, and, and it was like an applied business school, a very uh -huh. practical business school, and it was a terrific experience um, for me. Um, so, all right. So, so let's get into self self directed accounts. Um, I, I mean, I like I see you. I think many of our listeners see you as a knowledge leader in that area. Uh, is it, is it really, let's see here, is it really 10 trillion of, of, of potential capital or tell us? Yeah, and you know, it probably is more. I mean, you know, who knows when the stock market gets posted, but I, I mean, taking a step back, what you have is, uh, you know, in layman's terms is you have your old 401k that's now probably in a rollover IRA out of Fidelity, out of Vanguard. This number in the aggregate is about 10 trillion. In addition, this doesn't count stuff like TSPs, solo 401ks for our self-employed friends, uh, frankly, your current company 401k, which can be a huge number. So, right. uh, you know, from a rounding-ish perspective, and I share the 10 trillion in comparison to, you know, maybe it's 100, uh, you know, maybe up to 250 billion, but it's still a very small it's a big number. number. How much has been in self-directed IRAs for what potentially... I call this for my marketers out there. This is the TAM, the 10 trillion, the SAM. Uh, you know, we still feel it could be in the trillion range. I mean, 10% of folks' individual assets. I think if this education as we're doing here today is shared correctly and folks say, wow, stock market, what a headache, bonds, no yield. Uh, yeah, something like passive real estate. This is where a fair portion of my portfolio can go into. So I, I think it's a few factors that we might talk about today, but you know, the ultimate number, yeah, there's still a lot of room to go, but if it hits a trillion in 10 years, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. So then let's just shift over from a percent perspective of, of, the, of the money that's sitting out there mm -hmm. in SDAs, what, like, what percent is in like the liquid market, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and what percent is in something else? Sure. I mean, I just roughly like guess, yeah. estimate. So, I mean, self-directed IRAs, uh, just to be clear, although within your SDIRA, which is different than I'd say an IRA, uh, you could have stocks, bonds. Most people open a self-directed IRA because they have an event in mind that they have to fund, which is most commonly passive real estate, uh, potentially buying a rental house. Uh, yes, there is times when there could be a stock portion involved or another asset. Um, you know, so I just spoke. I'm I meant the capital before goes into the self-directed. The big yeah, a, lot, a lot of it is in funds. I mean, yeah. you to think with what you have at your current job and then you balance, you're like, well, yeah, it goes in eight things. And when I was at my current job, it's now a rollover IRA. Uh, folks don't get too savvy in day trading. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the likes of a Fidelity platform is allowing, uh, you know, crypto, easy way to mm -mm. trade, you know, individual crypto, for example. So with that, yeah, I think a lot of it is just sitting, whatever the funds were that you had in your previous job, it rolls over, you set it and forget it. And uh, right. until you get to a time like this, where, you know, it drops below 30,000 and everything else, you're like, wow, you know, maybe I should look to reallocate or at least be aware as, as the market moves again. Right. I, I think the set it and forget it, um, you know, it's per that's a perfect way to uh, describe at least my, the way I've treated it is, you know, it's there, it's doing its thing and, 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 you know, forget it. Um, so when you're speaking with people about using their retirement accounts uh, to invest, what are the, like, what are the obstacles that you like come, that come across? Yeah. I mean, the first thing is just the, I think the general education of, or just awareness, even before education, if you think of the Chevrons, most folks are just not aware. And there's two reasons. One is just, listen, we're all wired differently. And some folks, it's just not that, frankly, important or top of mind. And that's fine. And I just mean finances in general. Otherwise, you know, and I'll pick on my, uh, I, I'm a Warren guy, so I'll pick on the Princeton and Yaleys out here. But, you know, folks that went to the quote unquote smart kid schools and got their MBAs or even worked at the likes of a Merrill or otherwise probably never heard of these before, even mm -hmm. down to some CPAs or financial advisors. Uh, I think it's almost potentially an embarrassment factor. So, you know, they they learn it, they absorb it, uh, but they're not immediately an expert to their client base. And there's multiple reasons behind that. But those are, I think, just from an awareness side, why folks, uh, and then, you know, stating the obvious, it hasn't behooved Wall Street to make a big buck off of it. So we right. haven't seen 
but do you think it's the um, do you think it's it's just so, so I'm clear? Is it using the funds that are in that retirement account, or is it what they're going to use the funds for? Let's just say, as an example, multifamily apartments or self storage, or both. We, we, because a lot of people I and just to, to share a lot of you know some of the people I've talked to, they'll take money out of their like equity, you know, their their fidelity account mm-hmm. and put it into real estate. But then the retirement account piece, either I'm not explaining it well, or there's like an obstacle that prevents them from accessing that capital. Well, you know, there's another block, and the best example, like I have a real good friend in town here. Uh, he's mid 50 so he's almost hitting, I say, that golden age where there's no early withdrawal penalty. Uh, he's very involved in the startup community here in Austin. Uh, says I'm going to su- invest in some of these uh, startups that I, uh, you know, support. I said that's great. I'm like, did you know? Obviously, you know, we're friends. You know, can use your retirement. He's like, oh, I, I can't touch it. I'm like, wait, you've been Joe VC here in Austin forever. And you invest in these companies and you've seen the whole Peter Thiel and Roth IRA. Like, why wouldn't you go into a self-directed? It's just uh, almost like, here's the delineation and here's, you know, you save for retirement. A lot right. of us probably listen here. We're a lot of Gen Xers, you know, like you a little gray hair and it's, hey, you know, this is, a, this is in the future. This is way out there. We don't, we don't right. touch that. Or I don't know anybody else that has moved from, you know, probably at this point, a bunch of mutual funds or target date funds. Right. Right. So because your friends per se are too, whereas in your liquid account, it's like, oh yeah, we bought a beach house. We invested right. in crypto, all that other stuff. Right. It's like, That's exactly where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, so then take, I mean, just take us like through the, pro- like, you know, kind of not a great granular detail, the process of I'm a, I'm an you know, investor and I want to use my you know retirement account to invest. Like, you know, what are the general steps and like, how long does it take? Yeah. And, and I'll be you know, a little selfish here because I, I had a great experience with Rocket Dollar as an advisor, investor, employee, number one. Uh, the sign up per se is five minutes. Uh, right. And that's your account gets funded and you fund immediately. But my standpoint here is like you would do anything kind of in a COVID world or, you know, that feels like is very fintech, 21st century centric, probably very common what you guys experience in the Bay Area, second nature now. That's how long it takes to sign up. And then a form is filled out. And then you have what I'd also caution or be aware of is to look for checkbook control, not some of the legacy custodians. Why is that? Because much like you could with your piggy bank checking account, you want to have full access to your money to invest in what you want and when you want. So, you know, you do get an FDI insured backed checking account that ties. And then after that, you know, you invest once again in what you want, when you want a few small exceptions. uh, Right. It has to be IRS uh, approved. Yeah, well, uh, well, by IRS approved, meaning like the IRS tells you what you cannot do. So no life insurance, no collectibles. And the big thing is not yourself or your linear family. What does that mean? Not your primary residence, not a beach house where your parents go on the weekend, not your kids lemonade stand startup, not cannabis, but everything else is in play. You know, a buddy startup, a female entrepreneur, uh, you know, a, a rental house uh, elsewhere. Crypto, you know, is obviously has been very common. Right. Surprise, you know, buy high. <laughs> so low. Right, right. But, but, you know, it has actually brought a lot of attraction for folks that say, yeah, I don't want to be in a target date fund. I want to be in here, or at least for a certain portion of my portfolio, my retirement portfolio, I'm okay taking the volatility of, a, you know, potentially what crypto may bring because it's a long-term play for me. It's a high date. Okay. So then how, so, you know, I'm, I, 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 uh, I'm an investor. I've, I found an investment that I want to, you know, you know, put money into. I'm going to use my retirement account. I go up to rocket dollar approximately plus minus, like how long does it take between creating an account and then being able to fund? Um, yeah, I mean, very conservatively during busy season, very, very conservatively, I'll say a month. A lot of times it moves quicker. A lot of mm-hmm. times, uh, you know, even though it, things are laid out step by step, you know, life gets busy for us. A week goes quick, but it, hey, right. that's you know, a quarter of the process. Uh, separately, and this is probably of interest to our, our California friends, the solo 401k, also known as the individual 401k, is, in my opinion, a much more powerful account for reasons of contributions. You can take a loan on it, et cetera. Uh, in addition, it's uh, generally speaking a bit quicker and easier to set up just by nature of mm-hmm. the product. And a final thing is, you know, at Rocket Dollar, we, we looked and, uh, you know, I think it was our first 10,000 plus calls with 1,000 plus clients, prospects, et cetera, and said, what was everything that we did kind of ad hoc and asked for? And a lot of this was merged into, uh, I think the, you know, you always change the name of products, and it's the gold product. So still, you know, vis-a-vis from a pricing standpoint, um, very favorable, 
it's flat pricing. So I do want to bring up where a rocket dollar differs from some of the legacy folks in the space. Uh, you pay a one time upfront and then you pay a flat price. So on the course, let's say you have a little mm-hmm. time of the month to invest, you know, for example, one of your deals, Peter, Hey, cool. I'm going to open an account and then it's $15 a month flat, regardless of asset side of the number of transactions. Right. So you're not going to get burned from a fee so at the account level. At the account level, where a lot of other folks are, uh, I don't say nickel and diamond, because obviously, you know, you do have to support the team and such. It's just a different model where right. folks of a rocket dollar recognize the benefits of tech. And over time, tech is going to lower price on certain things for the same value, if not better value. And that's where we are now in a post-COVID world. I, thank you. And one of the reasons I wanted to go through that is that um, is to emphasize just you know how simple and straightforward it is to deploy capital through these retirement accounts using a rocket dollar or, or another you know platform that you're comfortable with. Um, so I, I wanted you know, to go through the process to get to that conclude, yeah. you know, outcome, which is that it's pretty, it's very simple and straightforward. And if I could, once it's funded, once again, with a checkbook control account. So this is, you know, just a quick message to investors, but also I know a lot of our friends are fellow sponsors out here. You want checkbook control money. So let's say if I'm investing with you, you're not going to know or care if I wrote a check for my piggy bank checking account or for my checkbook control self-directed IRA or solo 401k. So, I mean, there's literally been times I have a good friend, uh, you know, we shared it. We finally realized uh, I've invested in 29 of his deals over time. Wow. I'm more of a short term play, but he's never missed on a payment. Obviously, we have a great relationship at this point. Uh, you know, and it can be something like a Sunday afternoon. Hey, you know, here's a rounding error and this sort of deal, or here's this, or are you interested? You know, the wire instructions are out. I mean, he gets it in. Right. We're right. not filling out third party paperwork. Uh, you know, and I don't know if the ex- I actually forget if some of the stocks are T plus one, T plus two, T plus three. We're not kind of selling out and getting this and then withdrawing or oh, t- right. stamps and everything. I'm like, you're funded. You are good to go. Just like with your, once again, piggy bank checking account. It, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's terrific. All right. So let's broaden the conversation a little bit um, and, and talk about you know, what you're seeing with respect to investor sentiment. Uh, you've raised a significant amount of capital, therefore you've talked to a lot of accredited investors and family offices. What are you he- what are you hearing? From, what yeah, are you yeah. hearing from them? Mm-hmm. And then my add-on question is just how are you responding to whatever they're saying? Sure. So you know, first I'll disclose: not a CPA, not a right. lawyer. I'm also licensed under BB Capital, you know, Series Seven Sixty Six out of Dallas. So uh, this is me as a you know, the benefit of being at a fair amount of shows and having kind of our, our peer network here. Uh, yeah, I mean, high level. So some of it's just, I'd say conservative, not in terms of um, portfolio, but just from a mindset, uh, a few things that I think are good to share is like, hey, um, stocks are down, but there's high dividend yields. Okay, simple example I give, you know, the stock's at 100, the yield's at 5%, but it goes down 10 bucks or 10%. Guess what? Like <laughs> you're down 5% for the year vis-a-vis, I think, real estate, where when you invest passively, your value per se kind of stays flat, we'll call it, until the sale, which usually is a bump up. That's just a very sort of basic example. Uh, you know, second thing, I think, and this is, you know, no surprise from a bit of- So can I pause for a second? Um, because you, you're right. I mean, we, you, we hear and we talk about passive income, but, you know, most of the deals I see that we go after, you know, it's, it's 95% appreciation, 5%, you know, cash on cash return. It's probably not that. It's probably more like, you know, 85, 15 or 90, 10. But still, um, you, know, you know, that's the case. It's been appreciation. Are you, I mean, are you, is where you're going um, that investors are more interested in cash flow versus appreciation? I, I think so. And I mean, you're going to see this more from, from an older demographic, which right. is, but folks to the point. So for example, at BV, we have um, a triple net industrial fund. Now I share because industrial, okay, folks really haven't thought of that. I call it like the self storage of a few, you know, now because it's on all the type top five list. Um, uh, the point here is that it's a monthly distribution. So once right. again, I'm going to invest round numbers hundred K cool. I got a check in the mail within you know, six weeks and then next month and then next month. That's very powerful, um, you know, I think, especially in this environment, especially knowing that there is also equity appreciation at the end. And when people start thinking of, you know, really now in a down environment, people look at their taxes, they look at the true bottom line. It's like, wait, what does a K-1 give me? What does something coded properly as return of capital give me? There's a lot of things to right. start thinking through. And then, uh, you know, like, 
the one thing that a third party called a uh, fund I'm associated with, they called it a, a, a muni on well, a half muni, you know, because just of the tax benefits. So right. I think with that folks, particularly as people are entering retire age or say, you know, if I get this, I can retire a year or two early. There's a lot of sensitivity towards that. A second thing, uh, uh, you know, this is a side note, but I, I feel there's some credence to it. Once I think enough of the country feels as it's in a recession, I think you're going to see more people back in the office. So I've had some long time oh, in SoCal and they made it clear, uh, you know, hey, once one recession comes, you know, all of this. Right. All of a sudden people are wearing coats to the office, nice slacks and press shirt. On there. We'll be sweating. It's really true. I mean, I've lived through it. It's, it's, it's really spot on. And, and, you know, where I live, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I think all of the tech companies, especially, the, you know, the Facebook and, and you know, the Google, they're like, they're like, we're coming back to the office. Maybe not 100 percent, but yeah. we're coming back to the office. So um, I think I think you're right. I think a recession will accelerate that. Yeah. Uh, going back to the accredited investors and family offices. So, um, and I, you know, we went on a great tangent here uh, that they were kind of more interested, perhaps in yield. What else? Are, what else are you hearing? Sure. So, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, the, regardless of cycle or where we are, and this is, you've heard this also in front of open doors. You sit with a few family offices. A majority, of, pretty much all of them, will say we get ninety percent of our income from private investments, from real estate, from, you know, hard assets, from different sort of cross national plays, not from stocks and bonds. Right. So that that's, I think that message is, I think, doubled down at this point. Uh, you know, at least here in Texas, where I am, you know, a bit cliche, but land is king. There's enough folks with money on the sidelines. The issue is finding land. So, for example, we have a great real estate meetup. I met a gentleman. Uh, they develop synthetic concrete that's more eco-friendly, profitable, et cetera. Genius idea. And I would argue every development could benefit from that. But, you know, it's finding the developer. Once again, folks knowing about something new and innovative, that's going to save them as, you know, lumber's cost. I know it's coming down, but as everything has gone up and down. Uh, but the key, I think, is is finding the land. So a little bit, I think, whereas, uh, you know, FLs may have been a little more heavy handed, like, you know, I'm going to give you 50% or more of the money, but want hundred percent of the vote. I think that's coming down a little bit more to say, yeah, you know, let's really look to partner. I think for slower money, which I would um, say, you know, family offices have been a good proponent long-term of slow money, take self-storage. There's some folks that are moving away from the value add into development because, yeah. you know, from IRR, it's a very strong return if you have patient money. So I know, I right. think now the folks know, Hey, we're not going to blink and get, 2x in a year and a half. Okay, what's right. the 10 year plan? And uh, I, I think like that storage plays, you know, pretty well. And the final point kind of putting our worlds together here, uh, different types of storage. So convert convertible, we, you know, we talked about our family from the Rust Belt, the old JC Penney's Kmart, right. uh, very attractive out west. I know cold storage is very attractive. And then, uh, you know, for the one percenters plus luxury storage, you know, the espresso machine and everything else. So yeah. I think there's some niche sort of plays that folks see. And, uh, you know, I, I'm for, obviously I'm a big proponent of storage. I talk about the five, the four D's, but the fifth one being decluttering. Most right. of America cannot find a house with an extra bedroom if they can even buy a house. If you're in a two and two, you can't even get a three and three. The proponent of storage as an asset class comes in that much stronger. And you know, I would argue you can have similar arguments for RVs and stuff, but in certain submarkets, I'm not an expert there, so I'm not going to opine. Uh, but I think folks are looking at the full situation of how kind of a family operates and what they need. Uh, and I feel, you know, wholeheartedly, a lot of folks look at storage as an extension of their, you know, life experience to move their personal stuff and right. have that, you know, kind of space in their own place. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, one of the things you said in the context of storage, but, um, you know, from, from my perspective, in all times, the more niche one is in their, you know, investment, their strategy, their product, their location, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the better. But in, you know, a, a pending recession, um, you know, that's even more, more important, um, you know, to one's strategy. And, and that is, in fact, different than what we've experienced over the last, like, five or so years, where, you know, if you invested in, two, let's say, two, Phoenix, Say mm -hmm. invested in Phoenix five years ago, you could have invested almost anywhere, not everywhere, but almost everywhere. And, and over a five-year period, the, you know, all the boats went up. Um, 
And now, you know, things are becoming more difficult. The cost of capital has increased, et cetera. So you have more, more chances to lose. <laughs> so the more yeah. niche, you, go ahead. I commend you guys for looking at Tucson and looking at the macro. There, there, there are certain cities and MSAs where there's still a, a dire need for housing where I'm not saying it's easy, but kind of you can buy anything and refurb it. You know, the whole lipstick on a pig analogy, you're probably still doing good. Once again, not across the board. Another way to a separate, I'd say, strategy is, you know, I'll go back to Scranton, Binghamton, Syracuse, you know, pick your town where, where I grew up. Uh, like anything, if you can buy enough on the cheap from an IRR perspective, it could be very valuable, you know? Right. So th there's, there's different ways to kind of, uh, to kind of go about it. And, you know, kind of going full circle here too is, you know, let's just say, Hey, I really want to uh, maybe, you know, I'm not in position to give back, let's say to Scranton with my liquid money, but boy, you know, I, I think there's some great female entrepreneurs. I can use my IRA to invest with that. Right. I'll buy up a block and turn it into workforce housing, but with the mission, with the community in the middle, uh, you know, that's something also that, uh, right. Once again, I can't stay there. I can't personally benefit. Uh, but these are other things to think about as both an LP and frankly, you know, as a, I don't want to say exact LP GP mix to get too technical here, but buying some properties outright that you would rent out. Right. Um, that, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So given, you know, given inflation, given interest rates that are going up, uh, you, know, this, you know, the probability that there will be a recession, how is your business how are you pivoting your business? And, you know, maybe let's, you know, or, or contemplating over the next three to six months or whatever time, you know, kind of short time frame is, is what for you. Yeah. I mean, I, so for personal, uh, I'm layering across different asset classes, meaning primarily within real estate, different segments of real estate, uh, different splits. Some are just straight cash. There's a few, you know, legacy 1099 place, but I have them in my retirement because K1 isn't as effective within a self-directed IRA. So kind of per, you know, choosing where my chips go, uh, that's just from a personal sort of, uh, you know, portfolio standpoint, what I'm looking at. Uh, you know, high level, just to go macro real quick. Uh, yes, uh, inflation, definitely. Um, higher rates, yes. I think the thing too is, I mean, the, the excess of money that was printed, you know, politics aside, that's a big deal that, I think two things happened in COVID that, you know, one is, I, I just go back real simple, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, air, right. water, food, shelter, shelter, so we're putting a whole lot more value in shelter. And then what you have, and here's, I think, um, a great step for profit, a scary step for society is that uh, 30 years ago, very little institutional money was in multifamily, you know, mm -hmm. living wasn't really, eh, you know, a big thing. Nowadays, although you get some headlines of I think some very um, you know heartfelt stories one way or the other, a very small percentage of residential is in that private equity sort of money or in that private. Now right. I think that's really going to change. Uh, I think that potentially does a lot of harm to communities. Um, I believe it's Nashville, some cities that say if a shovel's not in the ground by a certain time, no more Airbnbs. We just don't want to see it. So there's other sort of societal um, sort of plays at it here that I think huh. folks are starting to there's that um you know here in austin we have a very uh you know unique we have another mayor election uh coming up uh, no primaries because we're switching from four years to two years is uh you know we see what goes on on the west coast with homeless and other stuff so there's, there's a lot of factors and i think right. certain cities in certain parts get to benefit from kind of case studies of cities that might be five ten twenty years ahead of them to put it through but yeah ultimately i um you know, with all of that said, so, you know, from a macro basis, I, I do think, yeah, you want something, you know, maybe it's the tips. I'm not an expert here, but I think real estate, once again, particularly with some back end split, um, I think that's, that's pretty good. You know, if you're going to get something that feels a healthy way of six, seven, eight percent dividend or a double digit without back end split, uh, you know, on the flip side, a lot of, I think, best of breed sponsors, I say, are cashing in on their reputational chips. Like, listen, I've been a rock star for so long. Uh, I just, I'm not going to give an 80, 20, which for right. our newer folks out here, that means you as an investor get 80% of the share, the, the person doing all the work, it's only 20. Uh, there's a lot of waterfall setups. And some of right. that is because, Hey, I do hard work. I do it. Well, other ones are like, I think it's an inflation head. Like if stuff hits the fan, I don't want to be 80, 20, you know, when we're at right. zero every Ben Franklin out here, uh, you know? Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. 
it's, it's a really good point. I mean, we, we, there's two podcasts we could have that con the conversation on, on splits and how that uh, the implications based on, you know, the changing economics. And then the, the other one that would be fun to have is <clears throat> your comments on how institutional capital while like coming in and it, like right now it's, it is really as a percentage, it's very small, even though we like, you know, lament how they can overbid us, but you know, what happens if it's, you know, you know, 10 X what it is, which still wouldn't be that like ginormous and what will happen to those communities and how will they change? Because the institutions are just, you know, they have different drivers. And here's a micro example. I mean, you guys are going to see it more on the West coast uh, just because of the natural cost of living, but you know, you had a family want to live close to family of four, lived close to grandma and grandpa in San Diego, saw a house called a million bucks, uh, you know, little yard and back. PE shop just said one, three or one, four, boom. Okay, what do they do? They put down an A and B and an ADU and back. The family comes back and say, hey, can I buy that? They're like, well, it's 1.2 million. What? Well, it's half the size or quarter the size. Right, right. Well, you can buy it, but you know, you can rent it. I'll use round numbers here for five grand or 10 grand a month. And then the family says, well, yeah, grandma and grandpa are down the road. It's kind of a good public school system. Guess we're gonna bite the bullet. Uh, that might happen, but what might be in the B or the ADU? The ADU is probably going to be, uh, you know, not probably, it could be an Airbnb, which, you, right. know, uh, you know, from a family setup. So I think there's a lot of these dynamics and um, it, it's, yeah. And I mean, as much as I love, you know, capitalism and, you know, kind of hands off of government stuff, this is just from a, uh, you know, like anything, I think we'll see how it plays out and much like right. how folks have moved to certain parts of the country for more social reasons. In a way, I think some folks are going to come back to say, yeah, I want to be back where 90% or 95% of the houses are people that own and walk around and live there every right. day. Right. Uh, right. And that's, you might not be in the, you know, you might not be along the beach or in the million dollar house area, you know, who you knows? maybe you and I may be back up in Ohio or something. So right. But uh, <laughs> Wouldn't be the end of the world. Yeah. There's a lot of points to that. So yeah. uh, you know, we'll see. So, you know, the reverse migration in little patches, sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Final two questions. Right. Um, I know that you, uh, over an 18 month period, spoke to <laughs> over 500 investors. Just in a couple sentences, you know, key takeaways. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these folks, I'd say, start it small, uh, either because they were handy with their parents or they just naturally had in their mind the BRRR, the duplexes, et cetera. Or, uh, you know, for guys like me that can't change a light bulb, you come in as a passive investor. Very few people went balls to the wall. Even if some folks get a headline to say, hey, I came out of the gate with, you know, 150 doors of multifamily. That's silly. But then you read the script and you see, well, they owned, you know, six properties and they managed them the last 10 years. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Right. So the, I, I would say the start small, make mistakes small. I think those that have been successful have, have done that. Make good Perfect. mistakes with smaller dollars. <laughs> there you go. With smaller dollars, but, you know, smaller mistakes. And, you know, thank you. So, um, all right. So knowing what you know now, what is one piece of advice that you would give yourself five years ago? Yeah. Uh, don't be a lawyer if you're not one. Don't pretend. Uh, don't, be, don't get greedy, even if it's such an asinine situation. Uh, you know, we were, so I'll go back, I'll give myself an extra year, six years ago, we were in baby bliss. I had a good friend. She was very conservative CPA said, Hey, buddy's flipping a house. Great part of Austin. I walked it. I'm like, Oh, this is a no brainer for a hard money loan. Uh, three months. Our son was born in the interim, you know, it passed. I'm like, ah, we'll give the guy another three months. And at that point, I'm like, uh Oh, this, this is, um, this is some issues. Um, he was a one man shop. So that's another piece of advice. Uh, be very cautious when you go with a one man shop, just right from the hit by a bus analogy to just, there's just too many things to do for one person. Uh, so anyways, uh, and then I really had to, fortunately, uh, I'm really open about the story. You know, I got out at 70 cents on the dollar, very fortunate for this, call it real world MBA. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. learned, you know, different states, different laws. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was, and then there was other cultural things. I'd say also, if you're investing um, outside of where you grew up from a cultural context, uh, it's not just the laws. It's also how everything operates to be very, so, you know, I say I can finally, I, I can never speak Texan, but I finally understand it. Right. This was a really good experience. Um, yeah, that's another thing too. I'd say also be cautious when you're going into a new market that you're not culturally. Right. 
Well, that's very insightful. Uh, Dan, thank you for coming on the show. If listeners want to get a hold of you, what's the best way uh, for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, LinkedIn is great. I'm pretty out to say that, you know, you heard it with us uh, this afternoon, Peter and I. And then separately, as a thank you, I, I say, if you can spell it, you can get a D. Krizanowski, 12 letters. Uh, you know, if you feel compelled to open a Rocket Dollar account, that will get you a, a little chunk of change on your sign up. So D. Krizanowski. And, and, the, and the spelling will be in the show notes, of course. Um, and for those listeners who want to connect with me or be on the show, please feel free to shoot me an email at peter at northlightgrowth.com or reach out on LinkedIn, Peter Pomeroy. Thank you all for listening, and I wish you a terrific week. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and leave a rating and written review to help us grow and reach more listeners. Subscribe too, so you can get the latest episodes. Lastly, to stay updated, head on over to verticalstreetventures.com. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, you can schedule a call with our team on the website. Thanks again for joining us. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode.